Professor Picard, the Belgian scientist, has made several ascents yielding valuable scientific data. In an aluminium gondola attached to a vast balloon, he has ascended ten and a half miles into the stratosphere. The balloon leaves the ground only partially filled with gas. For at great heights, the, height, the decreasing air pressure causes the gas to expand and the balloon to assume its spherical shape. In these regions, the sun shines eternally, and at all times, the stars and planets are visible. So begins the conquest of the stratosphere. The great developments made in the aeroplane during the war are turned to constructive uses to help make the world a better place to live in. Aeroplanes cooperate with rangers in detecting forest fires. A new use is found for bombs. Not to cause fires, but to put them out. On bursting, the bomb releases a dense cloud of chemical vapor. The fire is effectively stifled. These planes are not laying a smoke screen, but are spraying crops with insecticide to keep them free from disease. Russia and Canada, weeks of toil are saved by sowing grain from the air. The aeroplane speeds the doctor in his fight against sickness across the breadth of Australia. With the return of peace began the age of aerial transport. Bombers were converted to passenger planes. Within a few months of the end of the war, a regular service was established between London and Paris. Another converted bomber made one of the most magnificent flights in air history. In June 1919, a Vickers Beamy took off from Newfoundland, battled across the Atlantic through storms and dense fog, and reached the coast of Ireland 16 hours later. This frail craft was piloted across 2,000 miles of open water by the Englishman Captain Alcock and Lieutenant Brown. The age of air pioneering had begun. In the same year, Captain Ross Smith and his brother Keith left England on their epic flight over Egypt, through Arabia and Persia, on over the dense jungles of the Ganges Valley, the forgotten cities of Burma and Siam. Down the Dutch East Indies and out over the dreaded Timor Sea to Australia. Thus it was that in a craft similar to the one used by Alcock and Brown, a trail was blazed halfway across the world. In 1928, Sir Alan Cobham, already a pioneer of renown, left England in a light aeroplane to make the first flight to Cape Town. His advent spread dismay among the animals. Even the rhino ran for it. Only the lion stood his ground and roared defiance at his new rival. Cobham was the first person to make the double journey by air. From Spitsbergen, Admiral Byrd flew to the North Pole and later to the South Pole. So were opened up fresh regions where man might prove his mastery of the air. Old American pilot who had been flying mails across the Rocky Mountains took off from New York and flew non stop to Paris in 33 and a half hours, a distance of 3,600 miles. This was the first solo Atlantic flight. The Australian, Sir Charles Kingsford Smith, flew the South Pacific from California to Australia. Uh, Sir Charles, do you think that uh, this is the forerunner of commercial flights across the Pacific? Well, it's rather early to speak on commercial flying across that. Not a big piece of sea, but I certainly say the commercial flying across the Pacific will come. Uh, maybe not in one year, maybe not in two years, but it will come. In a light moth aeroplane, Amy Johnson flew solo to Australia, the first woman to make the journey. 
James Mollison flew solo from Ireland to America, and later he and Amy Mollison flew from Wales to America. In 1931, the brilliant Australian pilot Bert Hinkler made the first west-to-east crossing of the South Atlantic, flying a Puss Moth. A year later, the Frenchman Kodos and Rossi created a new long-distance record of 6,600 miles non-stop. In 1933, a fleet of 23 Italian flying boats under the command of Air Marshal Balbo flew from Italy to America and back. Distances were now of such little account that air races were flown over courses that only a few years before had been so perilous. In the 1934 Milton Hall Air Race, Scott and Black reached Australia in 71 hours. Gene Batten flew from Australia to England, from Australia to New Zealand, and in 1937 from Australia to England solo in record time. Squadron leader Clouston and Mrs. Kirby Green flew to the Cape and back in five days, 17 hours. But pioneering takes heavy toll. Among the victims were the lovable and brilliant world flyers Amelia Earhart, who crossed all the oceans, and Wiley Post, who twice flew round the world. In November 1938, three Royal Air Force bombers flew over 7,000 miles non-stop from Egypt to Australia, further than ever before, a triumph for pilots and craftsmen alike. All these and a hundred other flights now fulfill their purpose. Surveyors and map makers are sent out along the routes of the pioneers. Aerial photographs make maps quickly and accurately, discover hidden places, and help plot the best course for the regular air services shortly to follow. The peoples of the empire helped to build the aerodromes and later to provide the ground staff. From the sands of the desert arises a gleaming airport. In strange contrast is the guard of Arab tribesmen. And so an air service is born. After millions of miles of travel and endless experiment, Imperial Airways evolved the machine most suited to flying vast distances through hot climates and cold, the Empire Flying Boat. These people are embarking on a 7,000-mile journey to South Africa. The once remote places which yesterday were the goals of the record breakers are today regular ports of call. Besides 20 passengers, their luggage and provisions, the flying boat takes up to two tons of mail. One by one, the engines are revved up as the plane prepares to leave. Starboard in up. Board in up. rises over Southampton water and heads south to the Mediterranean. As soon as the pilot has set his course, he switches over to the automatic pilot, which takes control. Right. And does his work for him. The wireless operator now adjusts his aerial and remains in constant touch with stations along the route to give him his bearings and check his course. And so, via Marseille and Brindisi, Corfu and Athens, the flying boat lights the Alexandria, the air junction for Africa and the Orient. Soon she takes off again, her modern lines contrasting oddly with the native boat which has remained unchanged since the days of the Pharaoh. On up the historic waters of the Nile, inland over the pyramids, southward till the thunder of the mighty Murchison Falls is rivaled by the roar of the 4,000 horsepower engine. After her scheduled stop at Kisumu, she skims the waters of Lake Victoria. She speeds on her way to Mombasa, Dar es Salaam, Mozambique and Lorenzo Marquez, discharge her passengers at Durban within a week of starting. 